doing while I'm doing it. And I don't think too much about whether or not I'm going to be able to do something forever. I just think, am I doing it now? Am I enjoying it now? Great. Let's do it again tomorrow. And if there comes a reason why I can't do things anymore, like I had to give up on video games because I'm too obsessive. There's a few things in my life where I've had to go, okay, this is not a good thing. Let me stop that. But generally, I just try to find things that I enjoy doing and do them as much as I can. But it, that's why I don't understand when people say I'm bored. Oh, I'm bored. Like I could live a hundred lives simultaneously. If there was a hundred versions of me, I'd have a hundred different occupations. I would try to be a professional pool player. I'd try to be a professional chess player. I'd be a professional fighter. I would try to be a fucking singer. I would, I would find things. I, I am endlessly fascinated by things. Things to do, things to learn from, things, pursuits. And I think that if you could find things that resonate with your particular personality, just enjoy them and, and treat them as what they are. What, the, what they are is they're... they're sort of a replacement for all the things that gave you human rewards, the human reward systems that are built into our primate DNA. You need those. You, you, you can't just go through life just showing up, eating, sleeping, and going to sleep. You're going to get depressed. Like your, your organism, the human organism, needs problem solving. It needs complex problems. It needs stress. It needs some sort of difficult thing that you have to overcome and through that you relax you can't just have happiness all day like oh i just want to be happy like that's not real like you have to face discomfort for you to appreciate happiness if you live in southern california one of the things you realize is like the sun doesn't feel good anymore you know it's there every fucking day i went on a um a hunting trip once with my friend brian and my friend steve who we went to um alaska and we were in uh, Prince Edward Island, and it's like the rainiest place in all of North America. It rained every fucking day we were there. It was pouring rain. Sounds like England. It was, cra but it was way worse. I mean, it's crazy. It's like constant rain. Like, and we're sleeping in tents, right? So you think, oh well, I'll get in a tent, it'll be dry. Uh uh. There's moisture inside the tent. There's, you see moisture droplets like in the air when you turn your headlamp on at night. You you see like mist, like moisture mist, because everything is moist. Your sleeping bag's wet. Your clothes are wet. You never dry off. When I got back home, I called my friend Steve because I was in the car. I was like, dude, I have never been happier. The sun is shining on my face. I feel so happy. It's amazing because my happiness was greatly enhanced by the fact that I was miserable for seven days. Like, you don't get one without the other. You don't get true happiness. Some of the most depressed people I've ever met live in L.A., and they're in the sun every fucking day. And the people that live in places where it rains all the time, when the sun comes out, they're in ecstasy. They're having fun. They're laughing. They're at the park. You, 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 you don't just be happy all the time. And people seek these pharmaceutical interventions that are going to step in and change your brain chemistry and make you happy. And like, yeah, maybe. I mean, I don't know what's going on in your head. Or it might be that you need more physical struggle. You need more exercise. And they've proven that physical exercise, in particular cardiovascular exercise, is just as effective as SSRIs, if not more effective on most people. Dude, it's, it's so strange thinking back to my my 20s because I always thought that I was a depressive person like that was I was really bad I would get burned out at work I would spend days in bed I'd feel ashamed about the fact that ostensibly there was nothing wrong with me right so there was laid ashamed. on ashamed yeah laid on top of the fact that I was sad and didn't want people that I was we had 500 people that worked for us at this events company and we were supposed to be the party guys and we were supposed to be the ones on the front door that was g'ing everyone up and we've got this DJ and we've got these cool people and this is the night aspirational inspirational like outgoing gregarious extroverted people and I couldn't get myself out of bed I was like holy fuck like how embarrassing is it that I the person that's supposed to be in charge of this can't bring himself to go to the kitchen to get himself a glass of water and I looked at what was happening. I was going to bed at 4 a.m. two to three nights a week. <laughs> right. Dude, the first stable sleep and wake pattern I ever had was COVID as an adult. Really? First time I ever went to bed and woke up at the same time consistently since the age of 18 when I lived at home with my parents was COVID. How much better did you feel? Uh, 
it's indescribable. <laughs> it's indescribable the difference because of my sleep and wake pattern. And then that allowed me to really sink into building up a great morning routine. I already had a good morning routine. I was meditating a lot and doing stuff, but it was at changeable times and my mood was always all over the place. And obviously if you're sleeping late, that means that diet is kind of hard to really dial in. And then over time, you start to see, holy fuck, the momentum that you can build up when things are consistent, sustainable, replicable. It's the difference is so profound that I can't put words on it. And that's what you see. That's that 1%. Each conversation, each day, each little time that you do something, each interaction, the fact that you turn up early, the fact that you tell the truth as opposed to telling a lie. Every single one of those are mountain built on layers of paint. Yes. Every single time, man. And that's how it felt to me making a pivot, committing myself to doing something that I really cared about, committing myself to saying that I was wrong when I'm wrong committing myself to telling the truth, even though it's inconvenient, all of those little interactions. And it's that first step, I think, that a lot of people get stuck on. I just want that, mo that momentum to begin. I want to push myself down that hill. Yes. Chris, let's end with that. I love it. 